Our guest today is James Earl Carter III, affectionately known as Chip, son of former Governor and United States President Jimmy Carter and former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Welcome, Chip, to our program. Thank you. You know, you and I could talk hours about the Carter family and its many accomplishments, but I want to talk to you today about you, <laughs> Chip Carter. You were born in Honolulu on April 12, 1950, and grew up in Plains. Right. After your father had uh, left the Navy and gone back to run the peanut business. Tell us about your family and growing up in Plains. Well, I'll start with birth. Chip is Hawaiian for baby. And my blue armband when I was in, born had Chip Carter written on it, which meant Baby Carter, and that's how I got the name Chip. Um, Plains is an interesting little community. It was mostly racist, very racist when I grew up. My dad had a peanut business that afforded us the opportunity to begin work when we were 10 years old. I'd ride around the back of a tractor and pick up the tongue of a peanut wagon and tractor it back up and you'd drop the little pin in there. And that's how I started off at Carter's Warehouse. And I worked there constantly until I, until I halfway through college. Um, Plains was an interesting town and then everybody knew everything that everybody did. Uh, there was no secrets. It was a, a great, uh, almost inherited ability to, to live in the White House because of that. <laughs> because you knew that whatever you did, everybody was going to be able to um, to know about it. You could kiss a girl in America, so by the time you go back to Plains, everybody in town knew it uh, when I grew up. The whites and blacks lived together very peacefully. Uh, my next door closest neighbor was two, was a black family with two kids my age, and we played together at school every day, Saturday and Sunday, and that was the people that I grew up with. Um, and I think everybody in town had a similar uh, perspective on how, on the people that were there. It was always outside agitators, not ever the ones that actually lived in Plains. Um, shortly after Dad moved home, there was a, a huge uh, movement for to keep our schools segregated in the White Citizens Council. A group of Dad's customers came to him and asked him to join the White Citizens Council. He refused. And they wanted him, they wanted, one of the guys said, I'll give you the $20 to join. And Dad took the crowd back into the toilet at the Carter's Warehouse and flushed $20 down the toilet. And we lost 95% of our customers. Um, I think Dad's net profit for the next two years combined was about $460. We lived in public housing at the time. Um, and well, when he first came home from, we lived in public housing. And it was a real out. I got beat up every day at school. Uh, my uncle, my mother's brother, stood on the steps of the school one day and watched as the students tied me upside down from the volleyball net and threw the football at me while I spun around there. Um, so I was kind of raised in a, in a liberal, I don't think it was liberal, because certainly fiscally conservative, but in a non-racist culture, mostly because I think of the way my grandmother treated people all of her life and dead kind of picked it up from That's her. That's Miss Lillian. Miss Lillian. Tell us about Miss Lillian. She's a wonderful lady, uh, very stuck uh, in her own mind. She, you couldn't change your mind about anything, but, but she was always right in her own words, uh, fairly demanding. Uh, I got a lot of funny stories about it, but when I think she kept Amy most of the time when Dad was running for president, and, and she sat in the depot there, and, and lines of guests came by, and she was always very nice. Um, she, when Dad was elected and took office in 77, that uh, February, the next month, the President of India died, the ceremonial figure, not the Prime Minister. And my father asked my grandmother Lillian to, uh, to represent our country there and asked me, because she had been in the Peace Corps there, mm -hmm. and he asked me if I would go as her aide to keep her out of trouble. So we went and we did everything politically, protocol-wise, and, and we get to the funeral and everything at the funeral is interpreted into English. Uh, the Vice President of the Soviet Union was the first one to speak and my grandmother was supposed to be second. And about halfway through his speech, which was being interpreted, she turned around, I was on the fifth row, she was on the first. And she passed her speech back to me and said, there's too many people, I can't get up and give this. There was two and a half million people in the audience in a natural atmosphere. Had um, 2,200 different languages of press there. So it was a huge event. 
And so I grabbed this thing, scared to death, and I'm starting reading, and when it starts saying, when my son was a small boy, oh no. So, <laughs> so I get up and I make this speech, and, and since I'm speaking English, they don't interpret it. But nobody in the audience understands it because of my southern accent, and I realized that about a third of the way through, so I got real relaxed, and I made the rest <laughs> of the speech. But, but it was a, a, a really funny experience. Tell me about your, your other grandparents, the Smiths. I never knew my mother's father. He died when she was 12. Um, mother Allie, my mother's mother, raised her. Well, she was a seamstress for a long time. She made cakes. And then she spent 30 years as a part-time employee of the postal, the post office there in Plain. So mm -hmm. she was always there. Everywhere she went, she ran. She'd get out of the car and run to the store. She would, if she's going out to pick some out of the yard, she'd run out and run back. Uh, not very well educated, but well read, well loved. Mm -hmm. Held her family together very tightly, kids and grandkids. Um, and kind of served as a mediator there. Um, she, after her husband died, she spent her time looking after her children, never got remarried, never even dated as far as I know of that. Um, mom has, mom's the oldest of four, and, uh, and I think all of them got, went to college, and uh, all of them got a, you know, a good job afterwards and that kind of stuff, mostly because Mother Ellie just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and making them do it, which was, which was uh, almost unusual way back then. Way back now, then. your father's yeah. siblings, uh, Billy, and Ruth mm -hmm. and Gloria. Right. They were very active in his campaigns. Yes. Would you tell us a little bit about his siblings? <laughs> Uncle Billy? Well, Uncle Billy was a piece of work. Uh, he drank too much, but he also read a book every single day. Uh, he read five newspapers every single morning. And no matter what time any employee got to work, if they could come into the Carter's warehouse and pick up a newspaper and tell him the title of the article, and you, he couldn't give the details, he would give you five dollars. And that went on for years, and I don't think anybody ever stumped him. Uh, but he didn't drink much beer. He got up in the morning, he poured the beer down the toilet and filled it up with vodka. So he walked around with a Billy Beer can of vodka all the time. So, really funny stories. Campaigning in Wisconsin one time, and this, he was knocking this woman's door, and uh, there was a hole in the screen, and a cat came out and clawed him. And he kicked like this, and the cat went and landed against a tree, and lying there jerking, dying. And a bunch of press behind him. This woman came to the door. And he's Billy said, "I'm Billy Carter. I'm Jimmy Carter's brother, and I'm here campaigning for Mo Udall because <laughs> I don't like my brother." And here's the cat over there, you know. <laughs> I've got a film at home of the cat lying there kicking with the, and Billy saying that that one of the reporters took and gave to me when I came through, like. Um, but Billy knew his stuff. He ran the warehouse, did it well, extremely intelligent. Um, got along with everybody. Uh, he had a problem with alcohol, but his last eight years of life, he never, never drank a drop. The, all the dead siblings and his mother died of pancreatic cancer, for the four of them. And his father in the early 50s died of what they call yellow jaundice, which probably was pancreatic cancer. We assume it was environmental, um, but we're not sure. It's one of the highest incidences in the world. The only other one I know of is in Italy, where four people have died of the family uh, of pancreatic cancer. Um, I've been tested a lot um, to make sure that it's environmental and not something that's hereditary. They want to know if it's a hereditary streak there so they can figure out if they can mm -hmm. help other people with it. So right. one of Billy's children and me and one of Ruth and Gloria's children all go up every five or six years to the National Cancer Institute to be monitored and mm -hmm. see what's changed. Uh, Ruth was an evangelist. Uh, I used to go out to uh, Tyler, Texas, where she had her evangelical camp. Um, and I'd spend a week with her every year trying to get my own head straightened out uh, with God. Uh, other visitors there for two weeks at a time were Billy Graham and Oral Roberts and all these big evangelists would come out and spend the week with her or two weeks with her. Uh, Cat Stevens was a big, came out there all the time and he turned into a Muslim and changed his name. And came back and she told him that God loved him anyway. <laughs> but uh, she was wonderful. Um, they were all exceedingly smart. Gloria um, was an accountant. and. Uh, did a lot of that, but she and her husband ended up buying Harley motorcycles. In 1973, the price of land went way up, and they sold all of that land. Uh, bought two Buick dealerships in Alabama uh, and Harley motorcycles, and uh, they rode all over the country on the motorcycles. Uh, 
during the Daytona races, the motorcycle races, my uncle Walter, uh, who's a couple years older than Dan, uh, was a, the justice of the Supreme Court of all the biker organizations. So once a year he held court and he would, would uh, rectify disputes between the Hells Angels and the, uh, <laughs> the outlaws and all the other bikers. It would be a court. He had a gavel and he would sit there and, and uh, they would come in and present the things and what he said went. So he solved all their problems once a year. It's kind of a, a great guy. When Gloria died, uh, 50 bikers from all over the country drove in and gave her an honor guard as they, mm -hmm. as they drove and put her in the grave and her tombstone reads, uh, Gloria Spann, she rides in Harley Heaven. <laughs> so, great woman. She didn't campaign as much as uh, the rest of them. She did some in Georgia, but Gloria and, and Billy were on the road quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had uh, learned that at one time there were 11 Carter relatives yes. in 11 different states. Yes. How do you determine who to send where? Well, Aunt Sissy, I, I went uh, in May before the campaign, so May of 75. I moved to New Hampshire um, with my wife, and we stayed there quite a lot. My aunt, dad's grandmother's sister, Lee, and sister Sissy came and helped us in New Hampshire. And uh, they had an event in Maine, and she went over there and fell in love with some folks over there, just the people, and ended up pretty much staying in Maine. And I don't know if anybody remembers, but Maine happened, Iowa happened, and then Maine happened before New Hampshire. And if it hadn't been for winning in Maine, we never would have won in New Hampshire. So that pretty much goes entirely to Sissy. I was over there a couple of times, and Sissy was over there all the time. Uh, grandmother was always somewhere different. My mother and dad always traveled separately. Uh, my brother Jack, uh, wasn't a very good campaigner, so he stayed in Georgia and eventually let him down to Florida some, but Jack spent a lot of time in Georgia raising money and traveling around this area. Jeff and his wife moved to New Hampshire early, after I did, but there. Um, Amy was tiny. I mean, she was like eight, so she didn't campaign much, but she uh, went out with grandmother some and got some publicity and did some things, so I guess you could count her. Yeah. Um, then we had uh, Alicia, which is mom's sister, was out some, um, and her mother was out some. So there was a bunch of us on the road splitting it up. And people don't realize that Iowa wasn't important at that point. Dad's the one that made Iowa important. You know, that he went out and was in all 99 counties. Um, I've been in all 99 counties three times. Um, because of campaigns, I've been in all 50 states three times. Um, I've been in 95 countries in the world after the campaign, uh, so it's... Uh, it's You're always very close to your dad, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have problems with your parents like everybody does, but yeah, I think we're certainly politically very close, and uh, and I've given an awful lot of my life to him, and he's, you know, reciprocates. I mean, he, I'm a priority with him, I think. It's it's difficult sometimes when your father's... Your dad, your dad once said that, uh, that you are a better politician than he is, and you love it more. That's true. That's true. I'm a better politician than him. The best politician in the family is my mother, so who not only was better at campaigning, uh, but better with uh, everyday the day politics. I mean, she would sit there with dad at the dinner table and go through a list of things that, that meant something, mm -hmm. and he would listen. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you know, she worked closely with Hamilton and that crowd uh, in the campaign. Oftentimes, trying to get dad to do something he didn't want to do or whatever, but but they would go through mom often because she was that she's that good, and she still is. If you've ever gone out and watched her campaign or watched her just do presentations, she still gets along with everybody in the world and, yeah. and very personable. And and um, people feel like they've known her before. You mm -hmm. know, when they, when they meet her for the first time, people kind of feel like they've already known her, which is a, an interesting thing. And, yeah. uh, Let's go back to 1962. 62. When it all began for Jimmy Carter. 62. My, I was 12 years old. My father would make speeches around the 14th Congressional District. So if he had a speech in Richland, he would drive me with him and put me out in Richland with the bro brochures. And I would go in door to door and say, hi, I'm Chip Carter. My father's running for the state senate. And I'd give him a brochure. And I'd start go all the way around. Uh, and Dad, when he got through the speech, would start on the other side and come back until he met me. So we had that. And that happened uh, in 1966 in the gubernatorial campaign quite a lot, too. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing. Dad would make the speeches and then do the brochures. 62 um, was um, it was a tough year, I think. You know, the, He was on the school board. Uh, he ran for Senate. He got beat by 
like 80 votes and there was 160 votes that were folded 10 at a time voting in alphabetical order stuffed into box in Quitman County. And Dad hired two lawyers to help him out. They were David Gambrell and Charles Kerbo, who later became fixtures in our campaigns and in our lives. Um, and Dad met uh, Pennington, was it Brooks Pennington? No, Brooks Pennington. It, it, the, the, our, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution. Al Gulliver. Gulliver was there too, and a an, an reporter was named Pennington also. Oh, John Pennington. John Pennington. John. But, um, yeah. Dad met Gulliver and Pennington then, and they kind of got on Dad's side, and, and they helped with the press, which it never would have changed had they not been involved in it, too. Um, and uh, Moore, I don't remember his first name, but he was in Quitman County in charge of uh, the registrar and whatever. He ended up spending time in jail um, for that, and then later he was also sent back to jail for distributing moonshine, so <laughs> it, uh, it was one of those things. And that was the first year that we changed from the county unit system. Uh, to the direct vote for the governor. So uh, the South in Georgia lost an awful lot of power uh, because I don't know if you remember, but Sumter County, my county, had two votes in the county system and Fulton County had four votes. Yeah. So even though we had just a fraction of the amount of people, we had a lot more power. So right. this change was coming on and I think it was, it, it caused a lot of turmoil in, the, in that particular campaign amongst people, trying to keep their power base uh, when it was gonna be taken away right. from them basically. Well, so. your uh, your father's case, handled by uh, Carbo and uh, Gambrell, went to court. Yep. And the judge ordered a new election. Yes. And he won that election. Yes. He did. He went to the Senate. I remember. Yeah. I remember. I was page for him that year. Stayed in the Dinkler Plaza Hotel, and we would walk to to work, leave at six o'clock in the morning to walk to the Capitol and stop at the Crystal, which was at that time kind of new in Atlanta, and we'd have a big meal and get to the Capitol about a quarter till seven. And, uh, I think I mentioned to you the, the Bobby Rowan story about uh, when he was 26, he was elected to the Senate, and he strived to get up the earliest and be there first, but regardless of what time he got up, Jimmy Carter was always sitting in the Senate chamber <laughs> reading bills. Right. Well, Dad made it a habit to read every bill he voted on, and that was highly unusual back then, and my guess is it probably still is, but uh, he knew what was in them. So people like Bobby Ryan, there was a group, a small group of people of which Bobby Ryan was one. Ford Spinks was another one, Paul Brown from Athens, uh, Bob Smalley, uh, J.B. Langford. Uh, that was kind of a, a clique of people that uh, the dad hung with and they all got together and decided on bills and, and uh, dad wasn't their leader probably but but he would read the bills and tell them you know what he thought about it and that kind of thing so uh, a lot of those people Ford Spinks I think I left him out oh, those people and others were uh, became fairly prominent in Georgia as, as time went on and they grew older and uh, uh, a lot of them are very wonderful people still. 1966 Everybody thought your dad would run for Congress. Yeah, he had his eyes on Bo Calloway. Uh, and they never really got along. Um, but they had their eyes on Bo Calloway, and uh, he decided to run for Congress, and he was out campaigning, and all of a sudden Calloway decided he was going to run for governor. And I think two days later, Dad announced he was going to run for governor, and take it on Bo Calloway. Bo Calloway went on to be the Secretary of the Army. Um, was able through almost no money of his own to get Crested Butte uh, from the <laughs> Army. I'm not going to say anything else much about it. Uh, but he was also chairman of the Jerry Ford campaign against Dad. Right. So, so that we ended up fighting Bo a long time. After, the, after Dad got out of the White House, Bo Calloway called him one day and said, we have a thing in Crested Butte for mentally retarded kids to come and ski and we want to know if you would come and honor us by being there. So Dad ended up making that uh, priority and went there every year, still goes there I think almost every year, and he and Bo became pretty good friends after that. Uh, not that they would ever say so in public, but they, right. they got along and Dad went to Callaway Gardens to see him a few times. And Mrs. Callaway at Callaway Gardens has always been a close friend uh, mm -hmm. of us for, forever and ever and ever. Um, so, uh, you know, politics changes, it makes strange bedfellows, and, uh, but regardless of politics, people are people. If you put them in a room, they'll end up getting to like each other, even if they, they don't right. profess that when they get outside, as you well know. Yeah. So. Well, in that election in 66, it was, it was a Donnybrook, uh, you know, uh, as you recall, uh, <laughs> Ernest Vanderbilt withdrew. Senator Talmadge said he was gonna run there for a while. Mm -hmm. 
then he withdrew, and then that left, I guess, three, four pretty stout candidates. Uh, uh, Art Lettuce Arnold, your dad, Lester Maddox, and James Gray. Mm -hmm. So it was a fight to see who could get in the runoff, really. I forgot about James Gray. You're right. Yeah. It, was a, it was a big one. And uh, Dad and Alice Arnold were basically fighting for the same votes in that mm -hmm. time. Uh, there was some... The, the one I remember is Ellis Arnold, somebody standing up on a stadium with a podium with all these people up there reading a, a postcard from the friends of Richard Russell and Herman Talmadge <laughs> saying to the fact that they really supported Jimmy Carter and you know blah 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 and Ellis Arnold turned around and walked off the stage and got in the car and left. He wouldn't even speak after they read this postcard which was from friends of, not from the people themselves. I don't know who had anything to do with that, but it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, and then in, uh, that was a close campaign. I thought, we thought we'd won. I went to school the next day and about two o'clock in the afternoon, Billy came to school and pulled us out and told us we'd lost. But we had thought the night before that we had won, gotten into the runoff of Lester Maddox. I mean, been beaten Lester. But, uh, but we hadn't, but we finally got there. You, got it, you made it. We made it. Uh, getting back for a minute to uh, school integration. Uh, <clears throat> when Plains High School was integrated, you were, what, 10th grade? I was uh, 11th grade. 11th grade. And two black children walked mm -hmm. into the school with no incidents. So obviously your father's influence on the community uh, had some effect on that. It did. I wouldn't say there was no incidents. I'd say there was no violence. Um, they didn't hit anybody. So I got hit a lot, um, but I was really voraciously <laughs> against everybody that was racist. And I let them know when they asked me, I told them the truth. And I never hit back, so anybody thought they could hit me, and they did. I just was a nonviolent person. But uh, April uh, Wright, uh, who was in my class and graduated with me, was the daughter of one of, dad, of dad's uh, partner, sharecropper uh, partners. Um, and that was another reason that I got it. She's a wonderful lady. I still see her. Her and Brenda Oates, that was the two girls that came in. Um, and they both graduated pretty high in the class, and, and they fit in. It was, it was a difficult time, though. It really was. Uh, your family was uh, religious. Very. Your dad taught, taught Sunday school. Still does. Still does. Still does. And your mom is re religious. and and. Uh, and I'm sure your siblings. When I was in, when Dad was running in '76, I went to this guy's house door to door, uh, and he pulled me in and showed me a picture of him and Dad in uniform, and they served on a ship, not before they got in the submarines, a ship. It was right after Dad got out of the Naval Academy, and Dad taught the Sunday school class there and brought this gentleman to Christ, and here I am in '76, you know, 30 years later, and here's this guy. You know, with this picture of him and Dad, and this Bible with Dad's signature in it that Dad had given him in the, in the Navy, um, and I think this was in Pennsylvania. I mean, it was just like clear out of the blue sky when you knock on somebody's door. Um, but that made a, a big impression on me. Uh, and he's taught Sunday school his whole life. Um, he lives his life, I think, as he believes Jesus thinks we should. Uh, much more the Beatitudes uh, than the Ten Commandments. Um, I wish somebody would get arrested trying to put the Beatitudes on the courthouse wall because I don't believe people here, and the Christians actually view much of the Beatitudes anymore. They, it's so confusing that, so that they can get their little anti-abortion or anti this or that or this or that and they, they leave out the good stuff that, that God says you're supposed to do to your neighbor. Right. Um, so I live in the Middle East about half my time now. And to be, I mean, I'm in Jordan, but Jerusalem's about 45 miles away. Uh, Palestine's very close. And I was out in this little village one day, and there's this old well there, and this woman bringing up water, and she gave us glasses, and we poured, we were drinking water, and, and then she began to recite from the Bible, Moses being at that same well, when he met the girl that he indentured himself to the father for for eight years to get her hand, and ended up getting her sister's hand instead and had to do three more years to get her hand and and uh, it was at that well. And you're standing there 2,000 years later or more go, and it's just a, an unbelievable feeling that you get when you're there. 
uh, and my being brought up in the Christian the faith and knowing that stuff makes uh, me living over there so much more special. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a great Christian, uh, but I'm a great believer in God. Uh, but I also can believe that Muhammad is a prophet. Uh, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Muhammad is a prophet, so I'm kind of a mixture of the two. But, uh, well, it was obvious uh, in back to '66. It was uh, obvious that uh, although your dad didn't win, he had become a key figure in in democratic politics in Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, but he went back to Plains. And what did he do when he went back to Plains? He went back to Carter's Warehouse. Got the thing up and going better. Um, built his business. Uh, and. I guess he probably took a month off. We started campaigning for election again four years later. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> because he, he was gone all the time. I mean, it was, I remember Amy being born and and uh, Mom going to the hospital and calling Dad and telling him to come home. He got there from somewhere in North Georgia on time. Uh, but had she been a little bit earlier, he wouldn't have been uh, because he was out campaigning. Now, did, did the family participate in his politics during that period? Yeah, I was 16 years old. Um, we had our office at a hotel over on 285. I don't remember the name of it now. I mean, on 75. Um, and I would, every Sunday, Dad would have us all come there. We'd get there Saturday night. We'd leave on Sunday afternoon. I'd drive my car. I had a congressional district there to sign me, and I'd stop in every single store I saw and give out a brochure and tell them to vote for my father. And, and uh, I got $22 a week for expenses plus a gas credit card. So. I ate Carol's, Carol's cheeseburgers for 25 cents a piece, slept in my car, <laughs> got up in the morning and uh, put the coffee pot on the radiator of the car and crank it up to, to heat it up and learn to drink my coffee black because the uh, milk would sour and, and uh, that was at 16. So uh, I was on the, you know, I did that for months and months and months during that campaign. Um, or it seems like months and months, I don't know, it might have been three months, probably the summer um, after school was out. But, uh, what was the family reaction uh, getting back to 66 to, to the loss? I think it was devastating. Uh, for me, I mean, not, when you say family, you're not talking about dad. You're talking about everybody that's around. I think all of us were discouraged and perturbed and the Georgia voters had made a huge mistake, which they had. Um, and dad was kind of, you know, this is a bump. I'm going to be governor. And off he went to be governor. I mean, it took him four more years, but um, Dad held us all together at that point. Uh, talking about the good job we'd done. I'd come from nothing. He'd gotten way up there. He'd become a force in, in politics. And, you know, people recognized him when we walked down the streets in, in Atlanta. I, heard, I saw that people, hey, hey, Jimmy, two or three times walking down the street, when, which was to me was phenomenal uh, because Atlanta was such a foreign place to me, having been raised in Plains, that uh, it was this huge city. So. Um, it it um, it was tough, but you know life went on. The cars were house was there, and you know something to do. You come back home, you work hard. Um, it was a. And then in 1970. Yeah, we started off early. Did the same thing, you know. Had a campaign put together. Hamilton Jordan, as you know, I'm sure with your help, um, put together a campaign plan. And and Dad was good at at bringing us the family into the campaign plan, meaning that he'd sit down with a written campaign plan and he'd say, here's how it's going to work. And here's the, here's what we're going to do. You've got to do this by so-and-so. And it's, you know, I remember the 1970, I remember the 76 presidential campaign more. We're going to win in Florida. We're going to do this. But in 70, uh, he sat down with us with the campaign plan and said, this works. This is how we're going to win. You know, you have to go do this. You have to go do this. And here's the big plan. And we all bought into it and, and the family went out and did it. I mean, I think Mom, uh, after 76, was a lot more comfortable doing it. She was really nervous, I think, in 76. I have a picture of home of Mom and Dad shaking homes in the shopping center somewhere, shaking hands in the shopping center when they didn't recognize each other. They were just there shaking hands. Shaking each other's hands. Shaking each other's hands, not even knowing who it was, you know, moving on. But I got this great picture of that, and, and it, the, the shock on their face when they realized who they were they shaking hands with. Uh, but it was... Uh, it was an interesting time of time for all of us to learn, obviously, about Georgia. I mean, if you're doing like we are and you're living in your car and you're talking to people and you're in a lot of people's homes and businesses and that kind of stuff, the education that you get is phenomenal about Georgians. Um, the same thing's true about America when you're doing the presidential campaign. But uh, I think the first 
and most important lesson is that people are basically the same. You know? And if you treat others with respect, you'll get treated with respect. And that's something I think Dad has done all of his life. Rich or poor, uh, you know, wacko, radical, terrorist, or anybody else, Dad treats them with respect and, and in return uh, can accomplish an awful lot of things. Uh, I believe, now we're, not in seven, we're now in today's time and not 66 or 70, but I, I think today that our problem in America is that our government doesn't treat others with respect other governments or other peoples, and that's all that they had to do was not to feel superior and not to make other people feel like we thought we were superior. I live, in, like I said, in the Middle East now, and people here don't like us, and the reason they don't like us is because they think that we don't respect them or their religion or how they were raised or their culture or anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that our government, that we can help the cultural invasion that America's had throughout the world. I mean, that's something that people have picked up and, and it's not being propagated by our government, but uh, the superiority complex that we suffer from is something that uh, that we could change fairly easily, and I think that Obama will change next time. I think even Clinton, if um, McCain's elected, that he'll change that too. I mean, it's just been a sad mistake on our part. Um, but in 70, the, the um, campaign was fast and furious. We uh, Fundraising was something I was not involved with, but it took a lot more of Dad's time in 70 than it had in 66. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was out a lot more. I mean, we were older, obviously, also. But uh, he and Mom spent a lot of time. I remember Dad sitting in his in the house making those phone calls day after day after day, uh, and how he hated every one of them. You know, hated every one of the phone calls, not the people, but just to having to dial and ask for money was something that, that he never got over. I mean, he still hates to ask for money, even though. He lives in a nonprofit world where he don't own other people's money, so he's yeah. been doing it his whole life. But I think that uh, the governor's mansion and 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 uh, was phenomenal for me as a child to move into. Uh, I had a little suite in the basement, uh, two rooms, supposed to be the servants' quarters, but uh, our servants were all prisoners from uh, that came in from the prison every day, so nobody lived there. Uh, so it was a great time for me. I worked at the sat out front in the governor's office and uh, worked there for eight hours a day and then went to university, I mean, went to Georgia State University. And Dad started way back then this non-nepotism thing. So even though I worked there eight hours a day, I never got a paycheck. Uh, and still have never gotten a paycheck from any of the things. He's never got one from the federal government, never got one from the Carter Center. You know, it's not something that he particularly believes in. So. Well, an uh, unusual thing happened there in 70 when he was elected governor. Lester Maddox was elected lieutenant governor, and they uh, they had quite a number of, uh, of disagreements during that four years. I'm sure that that was very uncomfortable for your dad. It was, it was. Um, I rode a skateboard. Lester rode a bicycle backwards, and I could ride the, around the governor's mansion on my skateboard backwards because they was trying to imitate Lester. A uh, few things when we first moved in the very first day. Lester had moved out at Christmas and we came in and for Christmas Lester had given his son a brand new GTO and when we moved in the GTO was wrapped around with a large oak tree at the bottom of the driveway where he missed the curve. I mean it was completely destroyed. It must have been going 50 miles an hour on that little driveway. So, um, <laughs> so I, you know I kind of felt bad for his son actually <laughs> who I've never met. Um, but I think Lester became, ended up becoming Somewhat of a friend. I just dropped the microphone. Let's go screw you up. I don't have my glasses on. Uh -huh. But, um, Lester Max was always really kind to me, you know, very, always treated me nicely, um, called me Mr. Carter, you know, how he kind of bowed when he shook your hand, and, and um, he'd say, we got different politics, but, but uh, that doesn't mean we can't like each other, you know, okay. and, and I always kind of liked him, I mean, I, I certainly disagree with his politics, and obviously that, those racist elections they were in with Barry Goldwater and all that kind of stuff going on there. Uh, was a very difficult time in Georgia history. 
But I think that after racism, I think that nobody now that's seen it without racism would want to go back because our economy has gone up so much and, you know, I mean, there's so many thousands of things that's gone right for us because we, we've kind of shed that. Um, but it was a difficult time to live in, I think, especially in a little town where your father's a liberal or a non-racist. And uh, because I keep saying he's a liberal, but in a lot of the world, when I realized when I ran, when Dad ran for president, uh, a liberal and a conservative have to do with with spending money. That wasn't like that when I grew up in Georgia. It was all racist or not. Period. Uh, so I think Dad would have actually been a conservative <laughs> in Georgia if it hadn't been for racism, because as you know, he's pretty tight with a dollar or a dime, and. Uh, and I think his budgets reflected that, and I think that the stuff he did as governor with the zero-based budgeting and the reorganization of government and those kind of things uh, served him well and gave him uh, the opportunity to, to run for president. Speaking of his uh, fiscal conservatism, Bert Lance liked to tell the story about uh, being called in from the Department of Transportation to have lunch with your dad in the governor's office and having to pay for his own food. Yeah. $3.80 for a sandwich, I remember. I used to do the same thing. <laughs> Mary Beasley, I don't know if you talked to her in one of these things, but she would be a good one to get. Yeah. Uh, but Mary Beasley used to collect the money before you go in for lunch. <laughs> so Dad wouldn't see us giving it. But yeah, $3.80 for a sandwich and a Coke or whatever it was. And when I went and had lunch with him, I had to pay when I went in too. So yeah. it, uh... <laughs> His big, uh, his big uh, uh, program was reorganization. Right and uh, had some problems with it, oh, sure. but finally passed it. And do uh, you think it's worked to his expectation? I don't know what his expectations were. Uh, things were so bad when he got there that it obviously is, it at least gave a platform to figure out where to go from here. I mean, you know, this cut it back by 5% or do whatever. The reorganization was very difficult because it uh, involved a lot of people's fiefdoms. You know, people have spent years building up power in one little organization or something like that uh, politically, which is how things work. And then when Dad reorganized, a lot of those people lost that. So it was a huge fight going on. Uh, I think that it worked to his benefit largely. We used it a lot in the presidential campaign and the results of it. So just as an advertisement for what he might do as president, it was a really good thing. I, don't, I know that's not the reason he did it, because I, don't think, I know he didn't think about running for president at that time. But, uh, but it really was helpful, and we talked about it an awful lot, uh, zero-based budgeting and the reorganization of government. Well, he had been in the Senate, and he certainly knew how the, the government operated and, and what its shortcomings were. Right. So his plan, I think, was... Uh, fairly well accepted by the public. It was by the public, like I said, but, but you had the, the, the fight with the, the people that owned the little fiefdoms that they had built over a while, so it was a, a lot of individual skirmishes. But the public accepted it well, um, and Dad got made, you know, through that whole period he was making close friends with very capable people that ended up serving in the White House and in the campaigns and things that were really competent people who never even considered doing anything on a national level, never considered going out because people in Georgia just didn't do that. So uh, you can name more than I could. Well, I'm going to ask you about those uh, folks a in, lot in of, a minute or two. A lot of those people ended up in, in Washington. White House, yeah. In Washington. Right. And, uh, and I want to get into that, but but uh, now, a uh, uh, year after he, he became president, I mean, after he became governor, he realized that he wanted to be president. I don't think that's right. I think it was after that. After that? I think, um, I think what made him even think about it was all the presidential candidates coming through for the 72 election, staying in the governor's mansion and, and uh, us talking to him and, uh, you know, watching a lot of them drink a lot, you know, a lot of them came in at Muskie's had to drink five or six scotches with milk. Um, um, and I think that that turned that off, the drinking. So he never drank during the campaign or while he was in the White House or anything like that, but mostly because of that. But I think he realized in 72 that those people coming through put their pants on the same way he did. It wasn't anything particularly special about him. It was something that he might could do. And I think he started thinking about it after McGovern got the nomination um, and lost the election. Um, and, you know, Hamilton, they, they, 
crowd got together down in Bainbridge at Charlie Kerbo's cabin and, and put together a semi-campaign plan uh, that Hamilton edited and put out that we, we followed. Uh, and it was very extensive. And as you know, then Hamilton went to Washington to work for Bob Strauss and a lot of those people and, and ended up uh, putting together a campaign. Everybody, nobody cared because nobody thought we had a chance so we could do anything we wanted to, you know. <laughs> Power, sure, take, let him have it, you know. <laughs> I don't want to do that job, give it to him, you know, because nobody ever expected us to be, to have any kind of a, a chance at it. Uh, and we were, and Hamilton in that memo rewrote the rules. Like I said, we made Iowa important. Mm -hmm. um, we, we turned out 80% of the people that voted for us had never been to a caucus before. Uh, four years later when Kennedy ran against us. Uh, it's one of the best all-time political stories ever. Uh, but a guy named Eddie Jesser, who was our campaign uh, coordinator, uh, the press secretary there, was from Massachusetts and had formerly worked with Ted Kennedy and knew a lot of the press and he was out there so we did a survey and found this one county that was the worst we had and we decided not to organize in that county. So when the press would come in we would tell them we were doing really good and we would name that county. It was 30 miles outside of Des Moines so easily accessible and people would go out there and find out that we were just doing horrible out there and we would tell them it's one of our best. So even the night before the election uh, they had written off dead as going to be defeated in, in Iowa. I mean they because we had set, set Kennedy up so badly. Uh, and then election night, we won 98 of the 99 counties. We, the only one we lost was the one that we had told them we were doing well in the press had all been out to. And Kennedy had gone from an expected massive win to an utter defeat, which pretty much ruined him from, from then on. He never recovered. Um, that was 76. So, and was, by the way, the guy that ran that county was named Joe Trippy, And Joe Trippy yeah. got his kick because he was the only one that won a county for, for in Iowa. And so you talk to him and he talks about how he was the only one that won a Kennedy County there and that's how he ended up going up the ladder. And, you know, he ran Dean's campaign and Edwards campaign recently. But that's how he got his start, the county that we didn't bother with. <laughs> so, but Iowa was something else. I was uh, so much like the people in Iowa, so much like Plains, Georgia. They're farmers, um, they're practical, you know, common sense people. Um, and it was easy to associate with. Billy did a, a lot of campaigning there. Um, every grain mill or whatever, Billy was there, uh, helping at the scales or doing something, you know, and he's all, all these call-in radio things with t the ones that talked about the price of, of milk or the price of beef and, you know, how much you're getting for cattle, you know, for pigs that day or whatever. And Billy would be on those things talking about those prices and comparing them to the prices in planes and, and uh, just kind of making everybody feel like that we were all the same big family almost. Uh, uh, tell us this, Chip. Uh, Iowa was followed by, as you said, Maine and then New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Uh, how do you distribute your resources between uh, states like that which uh, have quick elections? Do you concentrate on on Iowa first and then worry about the other two? No, you're you worried, you worried about New Hampshire foremost because New Hampshire was the traditional starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, for an unknown candidate, you had to do well in New Hampshire. We won it, which was an amazing thing. Um, but there was two prong, Iowa, New Hampshire, and Sissy and Maine. But Sissy's budget, I think, was something like eleven thousand dollars. <laughs> like, you know, Sissy was just on the road. I mean, she didn't have any money, and I don't know that we ran commercials there except some that fed over from New Hampshire. Um, what we ignored was what Scoop Jackson and called the big one, which was Massachusetts, which was following New Hampshire. We skipped Massachusetts basically mm -hmm. um, and went to Florida. So. Um, but Iowa, we had a huge campaign going. You know, we, we had these people from Georgia, the, the peanut, peanut brigade, brigade, and then they went to Iowa and New Hampshire. And, you know, everywhere you went, you met people who had met people in the Pink Peanut Brigade. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was a, a real phenomenal effort and totally different from anything anybody had done before. A lot of people copied it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and people somewhat copied it. There. When I lived in New Hampshire, I would get up almost every day and have a debate. And I would debate one of you two children, and 
one of Sarge Shriver's children, uh, and Fred Harris's daughter. And, you know, we were just great friends. We would get out there and we would debate and bash each other all up in every school you could meet. And then at 11 o'clock at night on Saturday, we met at the Merriweather Tavern, all of us, and sat there and took off our pens and we had four or five beers till about two o'clock morning every Saturday night, you know, just kind of in a, a friendly, like each other atmosphere. And I still am good friends with Maurice Shriver and, and uh, you know, who was on the campaign trail at that point. Um, so, so it was good. You know, I spoke in St. Louis at the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner. And I use this story a lot, but there were seven children, surrogates for the seven candidates. And Hubert Humphrey was the keynote address. And we all had five minutes, and we got up and made our speech, and everybody could have made each other's speech because we didn't been around each other that much. And then Hubert Humphrey got up and talked for an hour and 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And he had the audience in the palm of his hands. I mean, he would look in the back and see an, uh, somebody from China, and he would talk about the corset coming from China, you know. And I mean, he was just, I mean, it was an amazing thing. We had a little reception afterwards. And I went back there and told him that I got really nervous when I spoke. I'd failed it three times in college. Uh, and then I shook like this every time I got up there. He gave me some advice, and he said, yeah, Chip, I heard you speak early, and my advice would be to always keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> I use that story forever, <laughs> but uh, but it was an interesting campaign, uh, and and like I said, it was just us with a bunch of real people and kids and you know volunteers that poured in up there, and, and the little organization we did. Chris Brown ran it. He was from New from New Mexico. Tim Craft ran uh, Iowa. He was from New Mexico. Mm -hmm. He was executive director of the party. Kraft was a New Mexico party, and uh, Brown had run the governor's campaign, King's campaign out there. So Dad went out and had dinner with him one night and hired them both, and that's how they ended up where they were. And Florida turned the corner. Iowa turned the corner, and Florida kept us going. Uh, before that election, only, they sent me to California. Um, and George Burns and I sat in this um, country club. Riviera or something, I don't remember what. George Burns with a woman, girl on each thing with the big cigars. Mm -hmm. And he would call people over, write a check for $1,000 to Jimmy Carter. He's the only one that can beat George Wallace in, in Florida, you know. And I ended up sitting there and collecting 300 and something thousand dollars in a day, sitting there with him. And it was all to beat Wallace in Florida, you know. So I think that was our big, you're right, our big test, that if we had lost to Wallace in Florida, then, then both Dad and him would have been wiped off the map. Um, what did you do there to beat Wallace? Uh, we ran a very positive campaign. Never said anything bad about Wallace. Uh, but it was a lot of, you know, we're your neighbor from Georgia, um, and we're down here. We had, that, we had an organization that was nonstop. We, you know, all the, all the regular polls had gone with Scoop Jackson or other people, so we had a bunch of the kids that wanted to make a name for themselves in politics, and, and we promoted them in the campaign and sent him out and did it. Phil Wise, who somebody else you might should talk to here, ran the campaign there. Um, and and it was just a people to people. I mean, you're talking about Peanut Brigade. They, from South Georgia, they were down there every weekend and every, during the week. And my mother would ride by. We had a thing. We'd ride through until we saw a radio tower. And then you'd drive to the radio tower and you'd walk in and you'd say, hi, my father's running for president or hi, my husband's running for president. We'd like to talk to you. So, you know, you'd drive in and sit down and you'd talk in the radio thing and you'd do that over and over and over. Today, the difference is that we worked our butt off for 30 seconds on the evening news. And today you've got this door-to-door -door coverage or, you know, on, <laughs> on the cable so that you're on the news all that you have to really cut back what you say to the news instead of trying to say something outrageous enough to get on the news. <laughs> so, so it's turned into a real different kind of campaign then. But, but Florida was, you know, it was, um, we spent money there, everything we had, I think. We blew everything. I think we were, we were totally broke when the Florida campaign was over with. But uh, positive advertising, um, not being bad to to Wallace, I think was a big thing. We were the one that wasn't jumping on him, the rest of them were, because he was, he was the one to beat there when we went. Um, but he liked Dad. He ended up uh, endorsing Dad, the first opponent to endorse him uh, after the campaign was over with, with 160 something delegates, I think, uh, which was a huge amount for us. Uh, and that gave us impetus to get the others to, to settle it before the convention. So, 
And then I, I spent a good bit of time when George Wallace my dad was president. I would go down and stop and see him every time I went down and do some special things for him. And, uh, he's my, Billy's wife, Sybil's first cousin. Is he really? And uh, so it was, there was a family connection that was somewhat exploited against, you know, in 1970 um, uh, that, uh, that was not exploited during 76. <laughs> so, but they came from the same town, Sybil and him, and she knew his whole family. And, and so the campaign picked up after Florida. Yeah, after Florida, people that never heard of us started giving us money, so that was a big thing. And, uh, and then the other candidates kind of split off, meaning that you'd all run against us in Michigan, and Jerry Brown would run against us somewhere else, and, and uh, Hubert Humphrey would run in Pennsylvania, so we never really met the field after that. It was always trying to go in and go one-on-one -on -one with somebody, so it was anybody, ABC, anybody but Carter, and uh, that, was a, that was a huge group. That was a remarkable campaign. It was. Did you ever think when you were working in the peanut warehouse at age nine or ten that you would one day be in the White House? Never. Absolutely not. You know, it's just something that came like, it's like being thrown to the wolves. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen the next day. On a campaign trail or being the president's kid, you didn't know if you're going to be speaking like I did with grandmother to two and a half million people or or uh, you're going to be seeing a blizzard in, in uh, up in Buffalo, New York. or. We we're going to send you to a, you know, it just, it didn't matter what it was. You just went and did it without ever even questioning it and, you know, not having had any experience in it. But, but you were supposed to go and do it and you did. And the whole family did it. It was a, an amazing push on everybody's intellect and everybody's psychic that, that uh, didn't matter what it was. You know, my favorite saying to myself is you can do anything for 20 minutes except hold your breath. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you get in front of an audience, my knees shaking, I can do anything for 20 minutes except hold my breath. I keep telling myself that 50 times a day because <laughs> we were doing it, you know, and, uh, straight from planes. It was an amazing, amazing campaign. And we made a, an amazing amount of friends everywhere. We stayed in people's homes everywhere we went. So another way Dad saved money, and we never paid for hotel bills. We always stayed in people's homes, even though I did have an apartment in New Hampshire. The first one I had was condemned. Um, we couldn't get the heat working. I had 30 people living with me that were all volunteers from all over. So we called the public health department because the guy wouldn't let us out of our lease. And the public health department came in and, and uh, turned the heat on full blast and came back four hours later and took the temperature reading. It was 32 in the bedroom. Um, so we got that condemned. And then we moved across the street into Man from Concord to Manchester, across the street from Levi's Red Era, uh, which was on the press several times in this campaign. They interviewed candidates there in this campaign, one of the places did. We were in the fifth story cold water walk up. And the night of the election, uh, I had moved, we had moved all of our stuff out and put it in the car because we were heading out the next morning. And the whole place caught on fire and burned to the ground the night of our election. And yeah. The other volunteers that hadn't moved out lost everything. Uh, that was, it was quite an experience. Played Cal Monopoly. California. How do you run in California if you're a, <laughs> peanut farmer from Georgia? Uh, you don't. And we didn't. We, uh, we screwed California. We went there and raised money. Oftentimes saying that we were going to put it back into California, but it never ended up getting back there, even though when we were saying it at the time, I really thought it might happen, that it was going to happen. But someone up higher up in the level decided that money should be spent somewhere else. But I spent uh, three months there the summer before the 80 election raising money. Um, and doing the pence. So I was there 10 or 12 times during the, the 76 campaigns just trying to get media and, you know, you'd hit three or four media spots seeing if you could get on the news for 30 seconds. That was basically what we're trying to do. It was much too big to organize and much too big to, to do advertisements. Um, so you depended on the national press as much as possible uh, and the rep newspapers. But it was basically a cash cow. I mean, we took the cash and ran, which I think is is still happening. <laughs> Florida was the same. I mean, Florida for years has been the same way. People go there. They come to Georgia now and get money and then don't come back and campaign. It's the same thing that happened in California. Though. So Jimmy Carter was elected president of the United States in 1976 and became president in January of 1977. Mm-hmm. You were at the inauguration. Absolutely, I ran. I helped run it. When Dad was elected, um, 
I think on the election was on Tuesday, I think on Thursday we went down to uh, St. Simon's Island to Musgrove Plantation. And after about five days I got up early one morning. Adrenaline, you know, you can't stop it, you've been living on it. About five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning I was up, it was dark, and Dad's cabin had the porch light on and Dad was sitting in a chair outside so he wouldn't wake up Mom going through briefing books and stuff like that. And I walked up and said, I'm bored. He said, good, I was hoping you'd go to Washington and go to the, and do the inauguration. He said, and I've got Secret Service take my car. So I had Dad's private little Pontiac, you know, and I drove up to Washington. Could park that thing anywhere. You could park in the middle of Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue and nobody would tow it away. It was a great car to have. You know? <laughs> so I went up there and worked out of the fort and, and um, Dad and I had a deal. I could call him on Saturday and ask him, no more than 10 minutes about the inauguration, any question that they wanted. Other than that, if people, everybody needed to go to me to get to Dad on the inauguration, and I was supposed to wait five or six hours and then go back and give them all Dad's answers. And the only thing I was supposed to ask Dad about on Saturday was stuff I couldn't decide for. So that's how we did the inauguration and put it together. And, and, uh, and I worked at Man, like I said, you could park anywhere. I mean, it was, it was the most amazing car in the world since you could drive around. Uh, <laughs> Following, following, following the swearing-in ceremonies, uh, your dad and mom surprised the nation by walking up Pennsylvania Avenue. Was that planned? Yes, sir. Was yes. When I went home, we planned that Thanksgiving. That was that, that early. We planned that we would do that, and the Secret Service and them. I sat down with mom and dad, and, and it was a suggestion that we had for them from the people at the at the inauguration. And the Secret Service and everybody agreed that it would be great to do, but not if anybody knew it was going to happen. So we never told a soul after that. It just We knew it was going to happen. Uh, we did do some special things like set up a few TVs, you know, give TV access areas in places that ordinarily wouldn't have had them uh, to make sure that that would be covered. Um, but we did that. And, you know, we knew about it. We went out and bought. My, my wife was pregnant. My son was born in February after Dad took off in January. So. We had her the proper shoes for walking and all that kind of thing. And then we had Georgia Tech put together this beautiful inaugural stand for us to sit on the grounds of the White House and watch the parade, and it was solar powered. Um, and about 20 minutes after being there, we laid this huge orange wire from the back of it into the, gov into the White House to plug the damn thing in. It was so cold that you couldn't move in that thing. And Omar Bradley was about to freeze to death in his wheelchair. I mean, he was just sitting there complaining. Who wasn't complaining? And so we ended up talking solar power and had these space heaters in front of us the whole time that nobody could see on TV. <laughs> but but uh, that first night in the White House was amazing. We did our inaugural ball, came back. The very next night, we watched all the president's men in the White House, it was right before it came out, and you're sitting there, and they are calling your new phone number. It was an, it was great to watch, you know. So it was a. Speaking of all the cool. president's men. Speaking of all the president's men, let's talk for a minute about the folks who supported your dad who went with him to Washington. Well, of course, naturally, Hamilton Jordan. Hamilton Jordan was uh, the editor slash architect of the campaign plan. Probably as good a political hack as there is or was in America. Um, gave everything that he had to my father. I mean, health, everything else. Um, accomplished. Because of him, we were able to overthrow the most powerful country on earth. I mean, if you're talking about <laughs> changing of regimes, uh, he's the one that did that. Uh, he was a, a great um, chief of staff, ran a tight ship, everybody liked him. He and I never particularly got along. When Dad uh, ran for governor in 1970, I was in college and was having a little bit of trouble with drugs. And Dad said, okay, get out of college, I'm sitting here working me in my campaign and sent me to move in with, it, with Hamilton. And uh, Hamilton had a campaign, uh, one bedroom apartment, so I slept on the sofa downstairs and Hamilton never liked it. Uh, he was dating Nancy Conan's mark at the time. 
and Nancy would come over to the University of Georgia and Hamilton would give me three bucks and I would go down to the Triple X movie theater on the corner and buy a ticket and spend the night there sitting in a, in a seat sleeping so that I could <laughs> come back in and uh, uh, I was the only person that could be my father's son on the road campaigning so Hamilton stopped anything I tried to do otherwise and during the administration or whatever. I worked for the Democratic National Committee and a couple of times they came up with plans for things they would like for me and Hamilton mixed them all the time because I was the only one that could do what I was doing. So um, there wasn't ever a lot of love lost but there was an awful lot of respect. Bob Strauss. Funny, uh, smart, shifty, powerful, unbelievable sometimes. <laughs> Uh, and never really a Carter supporter in, until we till we won in 76. Of course, he was with us from then on, but he was for Scoop early on. Um, but he helped us put together a campaign for the general election. He did an excellent job. He brought in all those old guys that had played the old tune for the long time and, and uh, that Dad was basically replacing because these guys were not any longer going to be in the administration when they, because and I knew Dad, so he mm -hmm. ended up putting all those people together for debt. And it was very, very helpful for us. Um, Griffin Bell. My mother's cousin. My father repeatedly points it out when he wants to embarrass her. Um, <laughs> Griffin uh, has loyalty only to Griffin. He screwed Dad many, many ways while he was in the White House and since. Um, has never been very close to us and was an absolute mistake. Dad's worst appointment. As Attorney General? As Attorney General. In my opinion, of course. Bart Lance. Wonderful guy. Uh, smart businessman type. Um, I think he's the only person to write a check to pay off the federal debt <laughs> while he was <laughs> OMB manager in, in Washington. Um, wasn't as scrupulous in his business dealings and still isn't as uh, my father would have been and which would have been required for the kind of publicity and stuff that they put him in. Uh, but as a Georgia banker, he did exactly like all the other Georgia bankers did. So it was, you know, it's 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 a difference in in those definitions and how you look at things when they get older. Uh, still a friend of the family. Uh, saw him not long ago. Uh, my son got married three weeks ago, and Bert was there. Uh, he and LaBelle. Um, they've had a tough uh, run with their some of the children. Um, I've tried to help some of the children on occasion. Um, was in business with him a couple of times, and uh, he made money and I didn't. Uh, <laughs> so that's as far as we should go with that. But, uh, but I think that he uh, really helped Dad not only get elected, but uh, with those power brokers and people, that, the same kind of crowd that Bert Lance helped with, I mean that uh, Bob Strauss helped with during the, during the campaign. And they knew they could talk to him and that, that he would be honest with them and tell them what was going on. So mm -hmm. I give him a lot of credit for what what's happened. Jack Maybe. Watson. Ha, ah, he ran the reorganization team, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. during Dad's administration and went on to, to work and ended up being chief of staff after Hamilton quit for the, in the campaign. Um, I know him fairly well, not, not as well as some of the others. He was never a day-to-day a -day at the campaign that when I was there, and I was on the road a lot, so I, the people I dealt with were mostly over the telephone. Um, but I think he's really competent. He came home and got beat when he ran for, for governor. Uh, Hamilton got beat when he ran for the Senate. Uh, so a lot of that didn't transfer uh, when they came back here. Uh, but I'm assuming that he's um, a great lawyer and is wealthy, and I think that's probably what he wanted to do. Charlie Kerber was very close to your dad. Yeah. He refused any position in the White House or in the administration. Um, but Dad got to do special projects, like with the Indians in Maine. The Indians claimed the whole state of Maine as a, in a lawsuit, and Dad got Kerbo to handle it, and he went up there and, uh, and got a compromise on it. It worked out well with everybody. I've always thought of Kerbo as Dad's father figure. You know, I didn't know Dad's father. He died when I was small. Uh, but Kerbo was, I think, the one that Dad would call 
for fatherly advice, not only political advice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the best things that ever happened to Dad was having that contested election in 1962 when he bet both David Gambrell and Charlie Kerbo mm -hmm. um, because of their powerful and positive influence on him after that. Um, as you know, the Carter Center has uh, the Kerbo Annex, uh, which is uh, it's the only one named for somebody other than Dad. Um, and I think that Dad felt almost like a father, that he was almost like a father to him. Someone he could trust with anything, uh, talk about with anything. He wasn't very good uh, running Dad's trust when he was out of office because when Dad got out of uh, office, the warehouse had so much debt we had to sell it. Um, and I think Dad, out of after paying off the debt, Dad's total life investment in that place netted him less than $100,000. So he got out of office, he was broke, which has probably not happened to many other presidents. <laughs> uh, but Kerbo was always somebody that we all respected. Billy had a goat named Mac that would ride in the front of his pickup truck on the front seat. And uh, Billy's wife, Sybil, got really perturbed because Billy wouldn't make the goat get in the back, so he always ride in the front. And Billy, t he told Billy he's going to have to give that goat away. So Billy put the goat in, a, in the car in the front seat. He drove it to Kerbo's house here in Atlanta. And it had a 50-foot cord, and he tied that goat to the doorknob of Kerbo's house and left about 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, Kerbo and them weren't at home. They got home a day later, and there was no vegetation, no plants, no anything within 50 <laughs> feet of that doorknob. That goat had destroyed everything in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Kerbo was the kind of guy that would laugh about that. And, uh, you know, I don't think he was liberal, and yet he was the first person I knew that had a cabin in South Georgia that was off the grid. He generated his own electricity. You know, he could have lived like a hermit there, uh, but he had the, the power generation going and solar panels and and uh, everything right there on his, on his property. I mean, this was back in the early 80s. I mean, right before anybody was really doing it. So I thought it was, I uh, always liked and respected him. He and Boo. Was How about David Gambrell? I think David and Dad felt more of each other as equals than as father-son. Uh, as you know, David appointed Dad uh, to the U.S. Senate. When Dad was elected governor before he took office, uh, Richard Russell was on his deathbed, and he called Dad to Washington uh, to see him. So Dad went up there between the time between November and January, and Richard Russell said he was going to die, uh, but he wasn't going to die until Dad was governor because he didn't want Lester Maddox to appoint himself to the U.S. Senate. Uh, so Russell died two days after Dad took office, and Dad appointed David Gambrell, uh, who um, lost the next election to Sam Nunn, uh, who turned out to be a great guy, Sam Nunn. But at the time, as you know, we were all politics is all personal, so we were all sad that David didn't win. But I. But looking back, Sam Nunn did an excellent job. So I don't think the state suffered. I think the Gambrells and we suffered, but the state didn't suffer. And our country certainly gained with Sam Nunn being there. Uh, some people thought that uh, your father should have appointed uh, Ernest Vander. Well, uh, that's the worst thing with appointments. You get to make one person happy and 20 sad. Uh, or mad, uh, and I think that's something you have to do when you you got to just take the responsibility and do what you think is right. Uh, Dad was not the typical Georgia politician when he got elected. He was not part of the power structure, uh, and David Gambrell was not part of the power structure. And Dad, Dad tried, you know, I think Dad purposely went outside the, the political power structure in the state to appoint David. Um, and I think it was fine. Vanderbilt might have won again. I think his daughter is now chairman of the party or something. Is that right? Um, but I always liked Ernie Vandenberg, too, who, who helped with Dad, also was a friend. But maybe we should have appointed him. I thought he always should have appointed you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might, I might have to gracefully decline. <laughs> but you wouldn't have then. <laughs> Probably not. One more, Jody Powell. I think Jody is probably the smartest of all of them, including Dad. Uh, has a real knack with people. Um, Never misses with a shotgun. I saw him shoot 100 out of 100 at Skeet at Camp David. Um, has gotten very wealthy since the Carter administration, but hasn't changed at all, which is not true for most of them. 
uh, still easy to get along with and, and talk to, still cultivates great friendships among the press, and he does a great job, I'm sure, for all of his clients. Um, and I think without Jody, that Dad might not have even been elected governor, much less the, the Senate. As you know, Jody was Dad's traveling companion during the governor's mm -hmm. years when Dad ran for governor. And, and uh, kept his notes and helped him write his speeches and you know just kind of was a surrogate I mean uh, an alternate ego of dad's and I and it takes him about two seconds to get right back into alternate ego of dad even today um, so you know I have an awful lot of respect for him as as much as anybody I've ever met there's often been criticism that uh, that President Carter had too many Georgians on his staff you think that's a fair assessment Maybe, but I think the people that made those criticisms are the people in Washington that would have had those jobs had somebody else gotten elected. Um, you know, like I said, Dad was not part of the power structure, so he brought the people he trusted and he believed they could do the job with him to come in instead of those people who had hung around Washington kissing fannies long enough so they could get an appointment to something. Uh, so that was a lot of the criticism, and I remember the, you know, the jokes with the Dad with the piece of grass coming out of his mouth holding the fork up and, you know, us being country bumpkins. But, uh, we were country bunkton, but we won and they didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it just happened to be that, that it was the country that we were involved in and, and trying to help and not uh, the power brokers in Washington. So we, had, we ran against that a lot. Kennedy really um, tried to coalesce all the power brokers that were there before Dad in Washington. So we had a lot of that group against us uh, in 1980 um, when we ran against them. And it was very difficult to get them back. Uh, I do know because I talked to Dad recently after Kennedy got sick and told him that I thought the two of them should get together and and uh, work out some of the differences and, and uh, that maybe neither one of them could get to heaven until they did, and he informed me that they already had. So I was very pleased with that, but uh, Senator Kennedy was a jerk when he ran. Um, he felt entitled, um, similar to the way Hillary felt this time. That it was theirs. It didn't matter what anybody else did. They couldn't, and they could not believe that he was being beat. Um, and he couldn't believe when he got beat that he wasn't going to win at the convention. And, and it, it went to him. I mean, it, he made serious mistakes during that, during the general election of the '80 campaign, of, of which he has, Kennedy has regretted. Mm -hmm. um, well, speaking of being a uh, uh, Washington outsider, how difficult uh, was it for your dad to pick a cabinet? And how did he go about that? Well, he had transition teams and, and others. He, they went to Musgrove Plantation and right after the election set up a group and crowds, people would come in uh, and make re recommendations for all the things. Uh, Jack Watson had already run a, an organization for a while that was kind of behind the scenes trying to, to vet people on who they thought should be doing what. So it was somewhat, somewhat set up on how to get it done by the time he got elected. Um, but a lot of the, you know, the cabinet came from from our supporters, but he, he didn't, Dad was never near as political as he should have been. Had Dad been more political, he would have gotten reelected. Um, but he just didn't, he wanted to do what was right, regardless of the politics of it. Um, Panama Canal Treaty was right, but what, six or eight? U.S. Senators got beat because of it, including Herman Talmadge. So, you know, there's some right things you can do in your second term. He did, wouldn't put anything off to the second term, except uh, he put off the Palestinian issue until the second term after the Camp David issue. Uh, so it still never gotten done. It would have had Dad gotten reelected. Um, but it was hard running that 80 campaign with Dad not being a politician, staying in the White House, letting Khomeini keep him booked, keep the mom taking, well, Mondale taking Dad's place. Dad, mom taking Mondale's place and me taking mom's place uh, on the campaign trail. And dad always in the Rose Garden. It was, it was difficult. Um, so. You know, I, speaking of that. Uh, I forgot who we were talking about. Well, we were, off on that tangent. We, we, were, uh, we were discussing uh, a choosing a cabinet. Choosing a cabinet. Which also brings up the question of vice president. You know, how did he uh, end up selecting Mondale? Is there any particular reason for it? I think it was tiny reasons. We had uh, six people come to Plains to be interviewed by Dad. They would all come in and fly in a little airstrip, 
we picked up in Atlanta. John Glenn flew the airplane, landed in planes, and bounced about 100 yards when he tried <laughs> to land in the Cessna 310, which all the press thought was really exceedingly funny. Um, but Mondale came in and had memorized everybody's name. He knew my name. He knew all of Billy's children's names. And obviously had a picture because he would see him and go up and say, I can. You know. Uh, he knew Hugh Carter, and Carter, when he did the store, he walked in and talked to Hugh, and, and he knew he, somebody had been down there taking people's pictures, and Mondale had memorized all that stuff uh, when he got there. And that made a good impression on a lot of folks in Plains, so Plains was for Mondale uh, because of that. Um, and I think that beyond that, Dad tried to see who he thought would be the best president, because obviously, you know, Minnesota was a Hubert Humphrey place, and you were going to win Minnesota as a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, anyway, it wasn't that he picked him to balance the ticket or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but I thought that he, Dad thinks, I mean, I think his Dad knew that he knew the Senate, you know, that he was well respected there, uh, that Dad could trust him, and that he would be a good president somehow. Um, and, and he was my favorite, like I said, and obviously everybody in Plains' favorite. <laughs> I mean, he knew the postmaster by name when he walked in. I mean, it was, it was an amazing something nobody else had ever thought of. But I'm sure he had to have somebody photographer that went out in advance to take people's pictures and write down the names so he could study it. Getting back to the cabinet, uh, the key cabinet uh, positions, of course, at that particular time uh, uh, were filled by Washington insiders. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't remember, I'm sure you will, uh, how many of those so-called insiders that, it, that your dad replaced. Cy Vance, I guess, was replaced because he, because of the Iranian hostage situation. Griffin Bell was replaced for incompetence, but he wasn't a Washington insider at the time, and later became George Bush Sr.'s attorney. Right. And he's from Americas, uh, which is nine miles from Plains for people that don't know. <laughs> uh, I used to hitchhike over there. That was the big city we went to when I was growing up. Um, but I don't remember the, the rest of being as being anything more than natural attrition. I mean, we made a Malay, Malay speech and that kind of thing. But yeah, but uh, Bert, I don't think the OMB was cabinet. I don't believe that was cabinet at the time. Well, it still is, so that wouldn't have counted. Well, it's just interesting to uh, to talk about what a president does when he comes into office, having all that tremendous responsibility of finding the right people uh, mm -hmm. for the right jobs. Uh, you well, mentioned Camp David. How often did you get up to Camp David? Very often. I went quite often when he wasn't there. Uh, it was a nice place to take a date. Um, cheap, you know. Boy, you're talking about cheap dates. You go to the White House with you. You buy a bottle of wine, you know, sit in the red room and have a glass and go downstairs to see the movie. I mean, it costs you like a bottle of wine. <laughs> and any girl would say yes. I mean, it was an amazing thing to have women chase me instead of me chasing women. It ruined my marriage. Uh, but, um, but Camp David was, is a wonderful place. It sits above um, an extremely secure communication system that where the, quote, red phone comes out of there. It's one of three locations. It's got a um, underground. You get in the closet in my cabin, you slide a coat hanging like that, and the wall opens, and you take the circular stairs down into the bomb shelter. And 180 people could live there for for a year. Uh, that's over and above the military that live there. Um, and it has all kinds of outdoor activities. Three three T one green chip and putt thing that Eisenhower put in and. And skeet shooting and you know golf carts and bowling alley, and movie theaters. So you know it's a really neat place, and it was totally private. When you live in the White House, you lose your privacy completely. Uh, so to and to be private was a um, became a real something that a lot of people strove to just find some place they could go where nobody was looking over their shoulder. Yeah. Uh, you know, I could go out to, I would date, go out to a bar or something in Washington and, and have a perfectly normal evening. 
Uh, the bar itself had called the gossip columns to say that I was in there doing something just to get the bar's name in the column. That's what they were there for. So it didn't matter where you went. Every single day, you know, people knew where I was the day before because the proprietors of the people that worked in the place were called to try to get the publicity. So, so that was kind of difficult. But um, I dated some interest. I dated Linda Ronstadt for a year uh, or more. Still see her occasionally as, you know, we're close friends. And, um, I had girlfriends all over the country. I had a blast. I was a single kid at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Were you accompanied by the Secret Service? Yes, sir. All the time? Yes, sir. Knock on the door to a date and go, hi, I'm Chip, and this is George and John <laughs> and Bill. And, you know, but, uh, yes, sir, I had it all the time. Uh, one week a year, but the president's permission, meaning he had to sign a formal thing, I would sign off one week a year. So I would go to Boston, and they would take me to a dock. I had a friend that had a sailboat and we would go out and sailing for a week. And they would take me to the dock, and then a week later they'd come there and meet me. I wasn't allowed to, to leave the dock without the Secret Service, but they, once a year they let me get on the sailboat and go off and, and do regattas and goof around you know, up in New England. So I did that once a year. But Dad was defeated in November, and the next Sunday I signed off Secret Service and bought a little Ford Escort and put 10,000 miles up before we went out of office just visiting all the people and doing all the fun things I couldn't do because I had policemen with me <laughs> every time I went. So, so, so I had a good three months. So after uh, your father's defeat, the Secret Service just left, huh? I had to sign off on him. Oh. He had to sign off. But mine went from me to Ronald Reagan Jr. And he was at the time in ballet class in New York. And so for Christmas that year, I sent all my agents size 12 tutus. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a, a great group of guys. You're supposed to stay no more than a year. But I was on the road for 22 months. My agents, nobody left me for 22 months. They stayed on the whole time. And each agent made as much as a director, which is the maximum you can make, because I was on the road constantly. I averaged 13 speeches a day, 24 days a month for 20 consecutive months in that campaign. And, uh, and the other times I was on the phone with Jody or back home and doing the briefings because I was answering those questions out there that Jody, you know, every day I'd get the briefing and didn't know what to push. Mm -hmm. So that was my life during that time. You know, it was all adrenaline. It was all, you didn't know where you were. The agents became your best friends because they were the only constant, you know. And uh, I was never late but once. Um, that's because the airplane had to make a landing, unexpected landing because of uh, air compression went out. We said there was this bubble, <laughs> you couldn't see above it, but we had this bubble above us, this cloud where the air compression went, it had to land. So that was the only time I was late. Um, and it was, you know, like I said, a really interesting time. I was in all 50 states three times and, and it wasn't that you saw the sights, it was that you got to meet the people. You know, people that go vacation and don't end up in somebody's home talking local politics or whatever. And that's what I did every night with somebody different. So, um, so it gained uh, your respect for the differences that people had by region, but uh, but also the similarities were just so so overwhelming that it was that it, uh, turned into a really good thing. The hostage situation hurt your dad, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Sure did. Comanian Kennedy, uh, and the failed attempt was uh, was tough. I, I got called. I was in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and got a call from my father at uh, four in the morning. Told me to come home. And when I got in the car, they put me through some kind of secure system so that they could tell me that the hostage crisis thing had failed. Uh, and that they were bringing us all back in for a few days. Uh, and I got there. One of the things I still have is when I went to the old loft city when I got in is he uh, wrote me out talking points on Afghanistan, handwritten, just a little blurb like he did. But I still have the handwritten Afghan stuff the, the same day um, from his talking points from what happened that day. And I have another one, the same thing. When Russia invaded Afghanistan, he did the same thing with the talking points. So but those were fun days. I mean, it, it was so much work. You never got to stop. You know, you, you go all day long, literally from factory shift in the morning at 4 o'clock to, to an event that started at 10 or 9.30, or you get off about 11. 
the drill and pumping so you'd have four or five drinks. I understood exactly why those politicians that kept coming through to see Dad did that, because it was the only way he could get to sleep. And then uh, without the alarm clock, you would wake up, and I had it down when it took me 20 minutes to get up, shave, shower, dress, and walk out the door packed, ready to move on to the next place. Um, and, and that went on over and over every day after day after day. Um, and I didn't make a mistake. I mean, I never got the press on me for saying something wrong. Um, I did say some bad things, but mostly they were told to me by Jody to say. Like, I blasted Billy two or three times um, when Jody would call me and say it was necessary that I do it. Uh, and I didn't want to do it. Billy hated me a long time after that. <laughs> uh, but, and then one day Dad had this, I was at, on the set of Happy Days. Uh, with all those people, you know, that, that was a big TV program back then. And I was sitting there, uh, Mrs. C was the only Republican in the whole crowd, the rest of them were Democrats. And this reporter came up to me for ABC and said, your father just said that he lusts in his heart. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that, but I know he's got the biggest heart of any man in the world. <laughs> and the, of course, that made the national news. That night. <laughs> so those were... You know, some of that was planned, sometimes it wasn't, but mostly I got local media. I was never where Dad was, never where Mom was, because I was trying to get the local media, the political reporters, like in Atlanta, if I was here, to, to talk to me and put an article about me in there. If Dad or Mom was around, or Grandmother, or even Billy, I didn't get any press. So they never put us in the same place because of that. So, so 80 was a very, very disappointing year. Yeah. Your dad had struggled through a lot of... Uh, of political issues that were not of his making. Right. And the Congress was not particularly good to him. Right. That's true. It was a tough time. Uh, and Dad was hurt by the rejection. I don't see how you couldn't be. <laughs> Over half the people in America say, no, that's a bad deal. <laughs> but uh, I had a great job offer from uh, Saul Lunowitz, who was on the board of directors of Ford Motor Company. And they wanted me to come over and spend a year in the Middle East, and at the end of the year become the managing director of the Middle East for Ford. And I had another offer from Ted Turner. And his offer was to come in and spend two weeks in each of his ten divisions, pick one, stay with them, and then in, the, in the six months come back and negotiate a salary with him. And those were the two I was really interested in. I went to talk to Dad about it uh, in the old office, and Dad said, no, I need you to come to Plains. So I ended up giving up those job opportunities and moving to Plains for two years. Um, which I regret in one way because I could have made a lot of money and done a lot of stuff. Uh, instead, I made no money. And, uh, the only way I could figure out to get out of planes was I called up Fritz Mondale. I said, I'll do anything in the world you want me to, but you've got to call my father and tell him that you need me to work on your campaign. <laughs> so, so Mondale called Dad. <laughs> so Dad allowed me to move to Atlanta and work for Mondale. So I finally got out of planes. I mean, Dad spent half of his life trying to get out until he finally did. Now he wants to stay there. I spent all my life trying to get out. <laughs> so, so I finally got out again. Oh. <laughs> but, it, you know, Dad did a lot of... He set up his woodworking shop, and he wrote a book, and you know, he did a lot of stuff there that I helped with during that time. And he's a doer, he, isn't he? He's a doer. He doesn't stop. Yeah. Even today, I mean, he, you know, I don't know what he did today, but I know at 5 o'clock he got up, and I know by 5.15 he was sitting in his typewriter, and then he was writing on his book until 7. At 7 he gets up, makes pot coffee, and then he gets a cup of coffee and takes it in there and wakes Mom up. He gives a little back rub and gives a coffee every morning. Sometimes rubs her feet. Um, gets a coffee and gets up, and while she's getting up and doing that stuff, he puts on the swim trunks and goes out and swims his mile. And he gets out, Mom's been up by then, and then she goes and swims hers, because it's a small pool, two people can't do it at the same time. Uh, but that's kind of the routine. I know that by 7 o'clock he's written two hours on some book or some article or some something. Uh, that's not Carter Center business, that's anything else. That's just him up there doing his writing stuff every day. And then he goes all day long, he wears people out still. <laughs> He's 83 years old, he wears out everybody when they're trying to be around him. Um, you travel the world with him, haven't you? Some, yeah. Tell us about that. He's a lot more respected internationally than he is at home. Most countries, European, Asian, when they have the, the gossip column, they write about 
politicians and business people, not about actors and actresses and those kinds of things. So in Germany, for instance, people know where my father is much better than I do because he's in the gossip columns. He's going, every time he goes to Africa, there's a little thing in there and they, everybody knows about it. Um, but I've seen him treat, uh, be treated with respect in the, in the worst of circumstances. He negotiated a peace treaty for humanitarian reasons, excuse me, in, um, in Sudan. And he had been with the SPLA and John Garang in the south and he had, uh, they had agreed that they would do a two-month ceasefire so we could get in and fight guinea worm and give vitamin A um, and measles vaccination. Uh, three million people died in that war, but still the biggest killer of children under six was measles, not starvation or anything like that. And starvation was a tool used on both sides of the war, but they were dying because they hadn't gotten that one measles shot. So he talked John Garang in, into the ceasefire, and then he went up to the north to the government of Sudan and to met with President Bashir. And Bashir told him, no, he wasn't going to do it. And Dad said, well, I was planning on sending my son here to manage it. It means that much to me, to you. And in the Arab world, that means more than it does here. And Bashir said, really? If you're going to send your son, then I'll do it. So I had been in Morocco, met with the king of Morocco, just got a deal where he signed this agreement to buy gravel from a gravel pit in Morocco to build his roads with. And we used that sign agreement to finance 10,000 low-income housing units there close to the gravel pit. And I had just done the deal and excited about it. And I'd gotten home on Saturday night. At 2 o'clock in the morning on, on Monday morning, 2 o'clock night, Sunday night, <laughs> the phone rings. And I pick it up and I hear Dad say, you wouldn't believe how beautiful it is in Khartoum this time of year. <laughs> well. I don't know if you've ever been to Khartoum, but Khartoum is in the middle of the desert. Everything is the same color, about the color of that mat. I mean, everything. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the roads, the houses, the streets, the everything is all the dust color of that thing. It's not a beautiful city at all. And I ended up going over there for two months. I uh, ended up getting stretched to, to four months, the ceasefire, the only ceasefire for humanitarian reasons ever done. Um, and, and, and it's an interesting thing. I had a deal worked out with Dad where I would call him on the phone from my hotel room. They had sent me with Arnez's, Ted Turner had lent that Arnez's uh, telephone that he had used to call in all the things from Baghdad during that war. And so I had this big satellite telephone thing that was a, you know, as big as a, a trunk. I mean, it was huge that I had come there. And we had it set up on the roof of, this, of the hotel I was in with the government's permission. But quickly, I quit using it because I could call and Dad on the landline at six dollars a minute, and I could explain something to him. And if I used a certain word in the first paragraph, the first sentence, then he knew that he was supposed to cuss out the president, tell me to go tell the president to do this or that or that or that. So we would do this, and he would say, "You go tell that son of a bitch, and I ain't gonna blah, blah, blah. You go tell him right now." Well, this would be the night before. Well, by the time I get up the next morning, I got a driver. I showed up there for the first time, and they had 60 Sudanese military to protect me. This is my first trip there, right? And a driver, a car with a Mercedes limo with number two on the tag, President Two, it had on there. So I walked up and said, "What are all y'all doing here, the cops?" I'm, I thought I was going to be looking for somebody to protect me from you guys, not you guys protecting me. I don't want any cops. All I want is that car. So I went over and got in the car and drove off. So that car was mine for the whole time I was there. <laughs> and I get in the car and say, i got to find the president. You know, my father's got, got to get a message to the president. So he already knew it. You know, we'd drive around. Blah, blah. He ended up taking me to wherever the president was because he, from the night before, we were on. the president already knew I was coming. So one day I'm driving up there, but taking me to his home in the suburbs, which is on a military base. And I've been told to stand there and wait at the door. And as I did, these people started coming out. President Bashir comes out, who I've met with 30 times and knows me pretty well by now. Uh, he'll speak English with me, but not with Dad. He doesn't interpret what I say, but everything Dad says gets interpreted to him. So <laughs> these Iranians are coming out, and he was introducing me to them. And I was shaking their hands. And the last one, he says, you've got to shake this guy's hand before I introduce you. So I shook it. He said, this is the student who took over the embassy in Iran when your father was president. He's now ambassador here to Sudan. And I kind of pulled my hand back and said, I don't normally shake hands with women. 
<laughs> and I try to walk to the president's door. You know, <laughs> the president, the ambassador, just standing, kind of staring at me because that's somewhat of an insult in the Arab world. It's a, it's a nice insult, but it's an insult. So I'm sitting there, and they had arrested the care worker in southern Sudan and had her on the house arrest and she couldn't get out and do her job and all this stuff was sitting there and the ceasefire was supposed to be going, they weren't supposed to be arresting people. And I'm sitting there with my finger in the president's tie like this on the <laughs> sofa and dad comes on CNN at the same time which is over in the corner and said, there's my father, he's the one that told me this last night. Well, the president already had a transcript of what dad had said the night before so he knew what was coming and he already had that before I'd ever get to see him, he'd already have the answer to what I wanted every time. So. So it worked out well. Then I, I did spend about six months total in Sudan, and then I helped. Um, I spent about six months in Liberia putting on the first free and fair election they had when Charles Taylor won. Um, so I, those are the two huge things I've done for the Carter Center overseas. Um, that was an interesting election. There, there's no government, all anarchy, uh, no monetary system, no checks, no credit cards, only cash, U.S. cash. So there's no way to pay people. We had to set up all the voting booths and we had to pay all the workers that worked there. So me and a woman named Denise from Washington each put $1.3 million each in a duffel bag and from our government, my government, who my government told me not to report it on the airplane. <laughs> so we walked on with our carry-on duffel bag, you know, heavy duffel bag, but all the small small bills because we had to pay people, you know, people were making like $12 a day. So we had all this change for, to pay people for three days during the election. And so we get to the airport finally. We, first of all, we get into Abidjan to spend the night before we take the thing the next day. And here we are with, you know, $2.6 million in, in our rooms. So I put mine above the closet and the closet above the thing and she put hers in there. We went out and had a part, you know, did the town and came back in the next morning. Have to check the luggage on this Russian airplane and when as the passengers sit down after they're in, they close the back door and open the front door. And then they throw the luggage in the front between the pilot against the pilot's door. So here's we see our you know, two million being thrown in. And we arrive at the airport in in Liberia and Monrovia and it's anarchy. I mean people they're trying to take stuff away from you. You know, they gotta get your your yellow card, your passport, and then your yellow card, and take your luggage and all that kind of stuff. So I had called some friends of mine that are Ruftians. A Ruftian is, they're all black, of course this is Africa. A Ruftian's about six foot four with a shaved head, dark clothes, dark sunglasses, even at night. Um, and they're guards for the king or the tribal leader. And each tribe, the 13 tribes had a group of Ruftians. So I called up this group of Ruftians who came in their pickup truck to the airport. And I told them I had computers trying to get to the office. I didn't want them to get stolen. So they were there and here we are throwing in the back of this pickup just $2.6 million <laughs> driving to our office. I mean with a thousand people around with their hands out trying to get stuff from you. It's only one plane a day. So we arrived there, put it in our locker and ended up having to pay everybody with cash. But that's just some of the the uniqueness of, of having an election in Liberia. Charles Taylor won that election free and fair and could have been good, would have been good, I think. It's the power government cut them off just like that because they supported Ellen Sharif, who is now the president. They gave her several million dollars to run for president there. He beat her and they never forgave him, so they wouldn't allow him to do anything with our consent. So they ended up screwing him and, and he just finally said to hell with it. He made all his friends rich. And he just instead of trying to govern. He'd already gotten rich enough. He wasn't going to, didn't need money. But after we treated him like that and wouldn't accept anything he did, wouldn't even accept his free and fair election when it was. Hmm. He kind of changed into a bad guy and ended up trying to overthrow Sarah Leone, whatever. But my MO was that every night at nine, if you're a U.S. citizen, they had a curfew and you couldn't go out after nine. The reason for that is because our embassy people get combat pay if they're in a a bad area and if they don't have a nine o'clock curfew it's not a bad area so these people lose 25 percent of the pay so if they're trying to put your kids in college you don't want to lose 25 percent of the pay so you keep it as dangerous as you possibly can in order for you to get danger pay and it's still happening today it's a ridiculous system that we got set up that way so at nine o'clock we had a curfew so the ECOMOG which was the, the military authorities from Nigeria had a curfew at 11 so at nine I leave my compound walk out to the crossroads where they had this big sandbag thing in the troops in the middle, give them all cigarettes and 
shoot the crap with them a little bit. Then I walked down the street. It was a big war going on, and there's 13 tribes. Each one of them had a section of the beach. And so you'd walk down, and this was pitch black dark, and there'd been no electricity or running water for seven years because of the war, so it was dark. And you'd be surrounded by these ruffians, these big black guys with sunglasses and dark clothes. And you would, I'd pull out $10. I had a Tevas, a T-shirt, and a pair of shorts, nothing else, no ring, no hat, no nothing. I'd pull out $10 and say, all I want to do is I want to buy a beer in your pub for all of you guys until we give out the money. You know, in any war-torn country, people never bomb the beer factory. Everybody wants a beer after a tough day of rape and pillage. So the beer factory is always there. They always bomb the glass factory. So you bought a beer for a dollar, you returned it, and got 95 cents back for the bottle. So if you went to a little pub where they weren't serving you the bottle, they just pop the top, they pass the bottle, and it goes around until it's empty and starts no Ten dollars, you could, you know, 30 people could drink all night long. <laughs> so I'd sit there with the chief, and everybody, we'd sit there till 2 o'clock in the morning, and then we'd have this group of people lead me back to wherever I was. And, you know, chief after chief after chief. Jason came down, my nephew came down, and, and I did that with him a few times, and he ended up loving it so much, he joined the Peace Corps and went to South Africa. But Charles Taylor, who was then elected president but wasn't taken, didn't take an office yet, well, actually, when Jason was there, he had. Clinton called me and appointed me, and I got an appoint Jason to represent our country at Taylor's inauguration. So we stayed there for four weeks. But I would go to see Taylor twice a week. He'd go, what are you doing down in this place? You know, I wouldn't go down there. They'd cut your throat and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I'm the only white person he ever met. They're, they're interested <laughs> to know if it can rub off. <laughs> the only other white people they see is have the American flags on the front of their cars. They ride by, you know, with their guards and stuff. But... Uh, that was a great time. I mean, it's all been good, really interesting. I've gotten to do some stuff that nobody else would ever get to do. So You certainly have had a very interesting life. Yeah. Did you ever consider running for public office? I ran for city council in Plains and uh, left that position to start campaigning for dad for president. So I was on the city council there. But if you wanted to do basic opposition research on me, it would take 30 minutes in Newsweek while Dad was there, you know. No matter what happened, all those gossip calls, everything that came out. Uh, so it wouldn't take long. For instance, I went, my wife's family, they were Griffins from Hawkinsville. Every year they went down to Port St. Joe, and uh, there was another family from Bainbridge. There was three families, and brothers and sisters, that would go with all the kids, and I would go with them every year. But one year we hired a charter boat, and we went out fishing. And uh, had a great time, came back. That night, that charter boat was arrested going out to some mothership and unloading marijuana onto it and running it into the shore. Well, I didn't know. I remember the guy's name now. It was King. He got busted, and the, the news was saying that, the, that I was involved and the Secret Service were, were messing up the sting, trying to mess up the sting they had going, and, you know, they put... I had met the guy that day when we had gone fishing in the dock, you know. That's all I knew about it. But you can take, just take that one thing and destroy me politically. So, no, I never thought about running uh, because I don't, I've had my life examined enough. Well, Jack ran. I mean, the only one that shouldn't have, yeah. He's the worst that. politician in the family. And, uh, I don't remember reading your Much, quote. much more conservative than me. Uh, much more of a libertarian. Believes in live and let live as long as I can keep everything I got and the poor people can't get nothing. That I can destroy the environment as long as it doesn't affect my neighbor's environment, but I can destroy anything that I own. Um, his solution for, for, for helping the environment in Nevada because of all the invas invasive grasses that have come in from overseas was to put more cattle on it. So it was difficult for me to be there and help him. And I would have voted for him. But I would have held my nose. I voted for Hamilton Jr. when he ran for the Senate, even though he said that he would like to send his son, he would be honored to send his son to Nicaragua to fight the Sandinistas. Um, but I voted for him anyway. I'd say, would have done the same with Jack. But I'm pretty liberal. I can do it, you know. I don't normally do that stuff. I spent four months volunteering for Dean. I've been for Obama for over a year, but because of Dad's, uh, because the Jewish community doesn't, respect them right now as much. I can't get involved in this campaign. It's the first one I've missed since uh, since I ran the 3rd Congressional District for McGovern in 72. 
That's a good story. 72, the McGovern dad's for Scoop Jackson. I'm from McGovern. He's put in the first caucus ever and the only one in the state of Georgia. And he wrote no special rules, meaning that he, as a governor, had to run in his home congressional district in order to be a delegate. Well, his district was my district, and I was working for McGovern. We had it in a gymnasium, America's High Gymnasium. And Dad walked in, he had Stock, Coleman, and Freeman, his two state troopers. Freeman's now the head of Fulton County Sheriff. Sheriff, right. Sheriff of Fulton County. Um, but they were standing there, and Dad walked in the gymnasium, and he stood under the basketball goal, and he looked over at the Jackson, everybody else but McGovern people. I had about 85 of them over there. And I had over 600 people there for McGovern. And I'm sitting on the top row, and you can, I'm sitting there watching Dad's eyes go down each row trying to find me. He finally gets to me up there, and he points like this and does like this. And I come down, and we walk into the bathroom, and Stock and Freeman stand outside the bathroom and keep the door closed. And Dad says, I need to be a delegate. And I'm saying, well, you should have gotten some people here to support you, you know? Anyway. I was running as the head of the delegation from that district. I had my name on there because I knew I was going to end up giving it up. I gave it to Dad in exchange for free round trip to the convention in Miami to work for McGovern. I got to stay in the do the whole thing. Dad paid for everything, plus gave me floor passes and all of that. So that was my little coup. And during there, there's a, when Dad endorsed Jackson, it was front page of the Atlanta Constitution above the fold. If you turn below the fold, me and J. Frank Myers from America's endorsed McGovern in the same newspaper. So, <laughs> same front page. So you're an independent too. Didn't get the front page very much. You're, you're independent as well as having that great love for your father. I do have that great love and respect for my father. He is the most caring, agape love of anybody I know. If you don't have as much as him, he loves you. If he can do anything that'll help you as a group, he'll do it. Um, without particularly any regard for, for money, he doesn't care about money, which is one of the gripes I have being a, a potential inheritor. Um, but he make you know, everything that Carter, the presidential retirement money. You know, those checks go directly to the Carter Center. All of his speaking fees go directly to the Carter Center. Um, you know, most of his book stuff goes directly to the Carter Center. So he doesn't, you know, he doesn't care. And I think that's what made him, helped him be great after he got out of office, is he didn't join those boards of Ford and other things like Jerry Ford did or the other presidents had when they get out. Uh, and never cared about hanging around those glitzy, ultra-rich folks. Mm -hmm. So when he comes at you, he comes at you with total honesty. And uh, uh, As a son, you can sit there and say maybe he could have been a better father. Maybe he could have spent more time with me. Uh, I could have been a higher priority. Some of the things you have to work through in your own mind, but at the same time that he didn't do that, he was doing it for everybody in the world. So, so uh, I have no complaints about it, really. Of namesakes of presidents, um, I think there's 11 of us and six of them died before they were 30 of alcoholism or suicide. So it's a pretty difficult um, thing to live up to. And it's taken me a lot of work and effort to get there, you know, because I can't be me. I've got to be his son. Just how people look at you when they first meet. So yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult. Yeah. And I, I think that happens to a, a lot of different people, children of politicians, governors, that kind of stuff. It happens to a lot of people. But uh, but he's been generous in including us and in making us feel part of it. Not making us feel like it's a family business, but making us feel like we're part of what happened and we're part of that. And that's been a big blessing, and being able to do all this other stuff is a huge blessing. So you can sit there and look at it kind of both ways. But Great experience. Great experience. And I'm exceedingly happy to have lived it. And I wake up every morning and tell myself, today's going to be another great day, you know. And I go through those days as a great day, because it's up to me to decide, not anybody else. So you can't let your expectations of your parents or your control how you live. You can't let dad's political views or somebody not liking you like that. If everybody likes you, you hadn't done anything. So, <laughs> so you got to have pretty thick skin. and uh, Just tell yourself every day it's going to be a great day.
Chip, we greatly appreciate you well, being with us. Thank you very much. Here. Thank you. It's been it's my been honor. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's my honor. You've been a, a friend and respected ally for since I was a teenager. That's right. And, uh, and uh, it's my honor to be here, and I really just appreciate you calling and asking because anything I can ever do for you, I'll do it. Well, Anytime, I appreciate any that. Any place. And Anybody. that goes for me, too. I know that. Okay. I know that. And I'll talk to my parents on Wednesday about maybe trying to do something. Please do. Please do.